In this unit, we're going to take a look at our first case study, the famous MNIST dataset. The complete dataset contains 70,000 handwritten digits from 0 through 9, as shown here. The dataset comes from two databases at the U.S. National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST. Since we have a mixture of digits written by high school students and employees of the U.S. Census Bureau, it's referred to as the Mixed NIST, or MNIST dataset. Here's an example of the actual form that was used to gather the data. As you can see, a single individual contributed many versions of the same number. For our purposes, that doesn't matter, and this has been taken into account when producing the dataset. This is an example of a single-label multi-class classification problem. Remember, classification just means we're trying to predict a categorical variable. In this case, it's multi-class because we have 10 classes to choose from, the digits 0 through 9. And it's single-label because each image can only be labeled with one class. 60,000 images will be used to train our deep learning model, and 10,000 have been set aside for testing our model. We're working on images, so we can think about this as a computer vision problem for which we'd use a convolutional network, a model of which is shown here. There's a lot happening here, so we're going to break this problem into its component pieces. In the first part of this video course, we're going to focus on the last steps of a convolutional network, which is just a densely connected neural network. As we'll see, densely connected neural networks can solve complex classification and regression problems pretty good. We'll explore all the essential elements of neural networks, and then in part two, we'll return to the computer vision problem with convolutional networks. The densely connected neural network that we're going to use is shown here. We'll see later on that the one inside the convolution network is going to be a bit different, but all the concepts are the same. To understand this network, we first need to know that each digit has been standardized to an image of 28 by 28 pixels. Since the data is grayscale, the color of each pixel is encoded in a single integer ranging from 0 to 255. So in R, we'd imagine that we have an integer matrix for each individual picture, which we would then arrange in a multidimensional array. I say appear as because in reality they are tensors, but we'll get into that in a minute. We're going to normalize the value so that each value falls between 0 and 1, which will correspond to the intensity of each pixel. Although we think of this as a computer vision problem, we basically simplified it into a large amount of numerical matrices. Okay, so that's what the data looks like. Let's review what we're going to do. Every machine learning project consists of three phases, data preparation, model definition, and evaluation. We'll see all of them in this unit. And in this module, we'll focus on the first phase, data preparation. In this project, data preparation involves four steps. We're going to obtain our data, rearrange and normalize the values, and reformat the labels so that our downstream functions can make use of them. I'll explain why we need each step as we go along. Let's head over to our studio and take a look at the data and the functions we'll use. If you downloaded the GitHub repo, you'll have access to the first case study file, so you can follow along. Make sure you've installed the Keras package, and of course, we'll initialize it with the library function. If this is the first time you're running Keras, then you'll have to run the install Keras function, or the GPU version if you're on a GPU system. Let's go ahead and download the data. All the data sets we'll use in part one of the video series are contained in the Keras package and can be accessed with one of the dataset underscore functions. In this case, dataset underscore MNIST with no arguments. We'll assign the output to the MNIST object. You'll notice that the dataset is a list of two elements. That is the training and the test set. I'll discuss what those are in a minute. Each of those is itself a list of two elements, the data for the images and the labels that are associated with each image. We want to make four separate objects, which is just going to make our syntax a little bit easier instead of constantly accessing lists within lists. To do this, we'll use a handy little operator that comes with the Keras package, the multi-assignment operator. The left side of the operator contains a hierarchical set of object names that mimics the structure of the object on the right side of the operator. Remember, the first list is the training set and the second is the test set. The first item in each is the image data and the second is the labels. So let's take a look at the structure of each of these four objects. The image sets are multidimensional arrays, which is to say a stack of matrices. The training set has 60,000 matrices and the test set has 10,000. Each matrix has a dimension of 28 by 28 values, which corresponds to the pixels in the image. Let's take a look at what one matrix looks like. If we use square brackets subsetting to get access to the first matrix in the train images array, we'll see the values for the first number. 
The values range between 0 and 255. So we have 256 values for the grayscale intensity at each pixel. 0 is black and 255 is white. We can plot the values as an image using the raster function. The indexing may look a bit strange if you're used to looking at typical arrays in R. Usually we refer to the rows and then the columns, and in a three-dimensional array, the number of the third dimension. However, these aren't your usual arrays. These are tensors, which is what TensorFlow is made up of. So before we go any further, let's take a look at what these are. The most basic data structure we have in R is a vector. In our usual R descriptions, we call vectors one-dimensional and refer to the number of elements as the length. A vector with more than one element is actually a 1D tensor, which kind of sounds intuitive, but it's actually a bit confusing, since a six element long vector is called a six dimensional 1D tensor when we're talking about TensorFlow. So don't let this confuse you. It's worth getting adjusted to it since it's useful keeping track of the matrices we're working on. The dimensions refer to the tensor and not the dimensions of the R object, so don't confuse the two. For example, a one element long vector is just a 0D tensor. In other languages, that would be a scalar, but in R, we don't really have that. We also know that in R, a matrix is simply a vector with two or more dimensions, which we'll now call a 2D tensor. We also have a three-dimensional array in R, which again is basically a vector with three dimensions, which we can now understand as a 3D tensor. So there are some quirks in naming convention, but it's not so bad. Tensors have three typical attributes. The rank refers to the number of dimensions and is sometimes referred to as the axes. The data type, which is like the atomic vector types in R. And the shape, which is what we typically mean by dimensions in R, or what we may think about as the size of a tensor. For example, a 2D tensor may contain a number of samples and many features for each sample, like what we might imagine an array to be, or even a data frame if we had mixed types. A 3D tensor may be a time series, since now we have another dimension of time. A 4D tensor may be an image, since now we can have many samples, each with a height and a width and a number of color channels. A 5D tensor could be a video, which is kind of like a 4D tensor with a time dimension. In an example given in the book, imagine that we have four videos. Each video is 60 seconds long, with four frames per second, giving 240 frames per video. Given the dimensions of 256 by 144 pixels and three channels for red, green, and blue, it turns out that we have over 106 million data points. In the end, this is just a 5D tensor with shape 4, 240, 256, 144, and 3. If you've worked with different classes of objects in R, including for images and videos, you're already familiar with the variety of ways that R stores data, depending on the type of data they contain. Just think of all the different kinds of lists that you've encountered. For beginners, this is one of the most challenging hurdles to overcome using R. Tensors actually make things much simpler because they reduce all representations of the data into matrices, which means that they are very easy to manipulate with matrix algebra. Actually, this is good news because it means that we have a suite of well-defined mathematical operations that we can apply to our data. And not only that, they can be vectorized which means they can be run in parallel and large-scale analysis becomes more efficient. So there are two really big advantages to working with tensors. First, processing gets very fast because matrices lend themselves well to parallel processing. And second, they are also incredibly flexible in handling all variety of data. Okay, let's get back to our image data because we're not quite done yet. Remember the first matrix in the training set? There are a couple things we need to do here. First, we want to get it into a standard format. So instead of a 3D tensor, we're going to compress it into a 2D tensor. Second, we want to normalize the values so that the range is between 0 and 1, not 0 and 255. This is pretty straightforward in Keras, so let's have a look. Our training images, we now know, are stored in a 3D tensor with shape 60,000, 28, and 28. We're going to use the array reshape function to rearrange our data into a 2D tensor. The first dimension is still going to be the number of samples, but each of the 784 pixels will be a separate feature. The result looks like a classical R matrix. If we look at just the first row, we'll see all of the 784 pixels from our 28 by 28 pixel image. The normalization is easy using vectorizations in R. We just divide our matrix by 255. Now all the values are between 0 and 1. We'll do the same thing for the test set and end up with two 2D tensors. So that takes care of the actual image data. 
But what about the labels? This is supervised learning. So those are just the labels that are associated with each image in the training and test set. They are both 1D tensors, where each value corresponds to the number drawn in each image. We're going to change the representation here. Instead of having the actual number, I want the probabilities of all the 10 different numbers. For example, the first training label is 5, which means that the probability of being 5 is 1, which is 100%, and the probability of all the other digits is 0, and so on. This is pretty straightforward in Keras. We'll just use the two categorical function. Let's have a look. It may seem unintuitive to do this, but the reason is that we need our label data to be in the same format which our model is going to produce so that we can compare the two results. Speaking of our model, now that our data is prepared, we're ready to build our first neural network. Let's move on to the next module and take care of that.